It feels so fancy being up here with the microphone. Cool. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt. You can follow me on Twitter if you want. And uh, I build stuff at SAP. Today's talk is called JavaScript Sprinkles, Avoiding Client Side Hill, with View Over the Wire, a brief tour of speedy Rails apps with turbulence and stimulus. It's a bit of a mouthful. So when I signed up to give this talk, I was planning to do like a tutorial type thing about Turbolinks and stimulus. Has anybody used Turbolinks uh, intentionally? Uh, like accidentally was turned on to like a couple people. How about stimulus? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm using these on a new project, so I thought maybe I'd do like a tutorial type thing. But I thought about it some more, and I realized uh, the documentation is pretty good, and I didn't really know what I could add in just this talk that would not be the intro material. So I thought I would try to do something a little different. So the thing that I thought was maybe more interesting is talking about how we got here. Uh, like, so how did Rails end up with this tool set? Like, how do they work together? What are the motivations of the people behind them? And like, what's the point of these these things? Uh, so as I was as I was uh, following along with the topics, I started to feel like Nicolas Cage, but like not that one, like this one, like from National Treasure. So there, I think there's like a pretty compelling and practical approach to building web applications that ties together all the stuff I'm going to talk about today. And it's kind of uh, hiding in plain sight. Like you can find some stuff about this on like a random old like 37 signals blog post before they were base camp. Or there's like a random conference video uh, where someone's talking about these ideas. Or there's like a one-off comment from someone who works at Shopify on like a closed GitHub issue. So you really have to kind of dig for this stuff. Uh, so I felt like I was kind of finding these clues and connecting the dots. So I'm here with kind of like a map, I think, of uh, how to explain it all. So I think maybe the best place to start is kind of like dump all the pieces and the people out and let's talk about like the history, the motivation, and then once we have like the lay of the land, you can see how it kind of comes together in present day, you know, 2018. Uh, or I might just end up looking like a crazy person. So let's start at square one. So Ruby, okay, I think everyone knows Ruby, hopefully. If not, you're at the wrong meetup. The, the Node.js meetup is downtown tonight, not here. So everyone probably knows that Ruby is optimized for programmer happiness. So it's designed to be like a joy to write and community values, things like expressive, readable code. Ruby is also like kind of weird. I think Miles was talking about it earlier. Uh, there's certainly some some characters dating back to like there's Why the Lucky Stiff, and now we have Aaron Patterson, and these people are they're fun and they're harmless. They're just a little quirky. Uh, and then Matt, who wrote Ruby, and a lot of the core team are uh, the Japanese. So maybe that'll be important later. So you go from Ruby to Ruby on Rails, right? So Rails was created by a Danish student working at a web development agency in 2004. It's 14 years ago. It was also optimized for programmer happiness, uh, particularly with values on productivity and developer speed. This was built by uh, someone who was working at a consulting company that needed to be shipping things quickly or they wouldn't get paid. And that's why it became a popular choice for startups because like how quickly you could get something to market, uh, maybe how quickly you could create a pretty terrible, crappy app, but at least it was quick. And I think the most polarizing part of Rails is kind of the axiom they have that's convention over configuration. So Rails prefers that things happen kind of magically if you put them in the right folders and name things uh, the way that Rails wants you to. So some people like really hate that, but that's okay because there's also this meme that Rails is omakase, which is this like shoehorn metaphor about fine dining. Uh, and that was used to explain that Rails knows best, but you can opt out of things if you like don't like sushi or something. Anyways, uh, that Danish student that I talked about was this guy, David Hennemeyer Hansen. He goes by DHH for short. He's basically like the CEO of Rails. 
he doesn't do all the programming anymore, but he mostly like sets the direction and strategy, and he kind of has like final approval on all the big stuff. And DHH works for Basecamp, so it's a project management tool. I labeled it up here as like CRUD++ because like many apps that I think most of us work on, uh, it's kind of like a document-based application and it's largely just people like creating and editing different types of records and viewing data queried by a different way. I don't mean it to be like pejorative, it's just like the reality of what a lot of computer software is. And Rails is very well suited for this because, well, like that's why it was made. Like David made it to help them write basically. Uh, DHH also has a lot of memes. He talks about this one, Majestic Monoliths. Uh, this is like the antidote to the rise in unnecessary microservices and like premature over-architecting. Like you would not catch DHH using like Kubernetes. He would not be into that. Um, he talks about sharp knives, which is making tools that can be dangerous, but like we trust you to use them uh, and not hurt yourself. So they're dangerous, but they're also powerful. Uh, mostly relevant to this talk is this other meme he has that's called like JavaScript sprinkles. And that's the idea that JavaScript is mostly terrible and you should only use it in small amounts. Uh, and this is like a lot of flowery language that David likes to use, like to, you know, you should use JavaScript to pleasantly augment your app with delightful little flourishes. Um, yeah, DHH, he's also a professional race car driver. I don't know, like I'm not joking, he's like a legit semi-pro Le Mans driver. Um, and if you decide to follow him on Twitter, you will of course know that he loves socialism. Yeah, so I think you probably know most of this. So now we're getting to the, like, the starts of the rabbit hole here. Uh, so there's this guy, Chris Wainstrath. He's one of the founders of GitHub. That's another one of these like CRUD++ document web apps that I'm sure everyone here uses. Uh, way back in like 2011, Chris was pushing this idea that was called PJAX that was used at GitHub and they uh, used it to make things fast because Rails was very slow back then. If you were around in the community, you remember this is the time when everyone was like, Rails can't scale and Twitter was like exploding and everyone was saying it was because of Rails. That recently came back full circle. Uh, so PJAX is this kind of nickname for push state plus Ajax. So the idea is you would make Ajax calls to get some HTML and then you'd use push state on the browser to like fake out the user that you loaded a new page, like surprise. Uh, at the time there was a lot of uh, JavaScript MEC frameworks were kind of just getting started. And I guess they all did this dumb thing where they broke the back button in the browser and people were like, well, I guess that's just okay. Uh, so PJAX didn't do that and that was why everyone kind of thought it was neat. It was like a hybrid approach. You could get some of the performance of these client-side apps. And like back then it was like backbone, backbone era stuff. Uh, but you don't have to, you know, actually use those client-side things. So. Um, Everyone's just like chilling. It's 2011. Fast forward 2012. DHH drops this bomb of a blog post as he's known to do. Uh, so Basecamp decided, you know, they say like never rewrite software, and Basecamp is like we're rewriting everything all the time. So they decided to rewrite the whole app, and they were calling it Basecamp Next. Uh, it, it's funny when I was looking back through the timeline, you can see all these like naming patterns. There was like, oh yeah, I remember when people used to say like Next. It's like the next version of things. So David outlined uh, some interesting, and they were really actually kind of novel at the time, techniques that they used to make Basecamp Next really fast. Uh, the two highlights were this thing called Stacker, which was more or less PJAX. They just optimized it for a UI where you mimicked stacking pieces of paper. And so remember, it's 2012, like skeuomorphism is very cool. The iPhone is just, you know, just becoming popular. So. Uh, yeah, the other thing was that David talked about how they made heavy use of caching and nesting, nested caching, and they coined this term Russian doll caching, which is based on those little Russian dolls that you stack up and each, each one is slightly bigger. So you would cache like a tiny part of the page and you could also cache like a level above it in the hierarchy and then you would know that when the top level thing changed it has to like cascade down, bust through all that nesting. 
so as what typically happens when Basecamp does some stuff is that they end up like pushing it into Rails, which is usually a good thing. Uh, so Rails 4 came out, and that was kind of like a, a huge release for Rails. Uh, this was like 2013. Uh, both of those features, the, the stacks paper thing, and then this Russian doll caching, those got backported into the core Rails framework, and so they were part of this big, big release. So in Rails 4, uh, active record objects came with this like out of the box built in way to do the cache expiration, which is typically the hardest part about caching. You know, it's in that joke about you know the X number of things that are hard about computer science, and one is caching validation. So. Uh, Rails made that super easy, and then Stacker was like, uh, it was generalized, they got rid of the paper thing because it was silly, and renamed it to TurboLinks. Uh, I thought this was funny, we have this, the Rails Way book, There's, there was a book published called The Rails 4 Way, like, that had a shelf life of probably nine months. Uh, so far we haven't really talked about like, how these things actually work, so I'll just give a brief uh, 30,000 foot view here. So, TurboLinks is a JavaScript library, and it intercepts clicks that you do on links, like specifically a, you know, href tags. Uh, and instead of having the browser go to that page, it makes an AJAX XHR request, and then Rails renders the full page back, and then TurboLinks just swaps out the body, and then it uses the browser history API to change the URL. So this makes things like appear way faster because all the stuff that's in the head tag uh, doesn't get reloaded, and that's like your scripts, your style sheets, and they don't need to be processed again. So you just have to render the new content, and it turns out that browsers are really fast at rendering content, and all the browser vendors are trying to optimize that because they want their browsers to be perceived as fast, so they're always improving the rendering engines. So that part of the equation has only gotten better over time. So basically, as long as you could render a new page pretty quickly, you could click around your app and it was really fast and it felt like it was almost instant. Uh, you didn't have to change anything about your app because Triple Links would just hook into regular links. It would automatically do it. Well, except it, it kind of didn't. So Turbo Links came out and everyone hated it. Uh, and it was broken. People had lots of terrible like jQuery spaghetti and plugins and this was all due to the fact that everyone made this assumption that when the page loaded, there's that sweet little jQuery document ready callback that was gonna fire. But with TurboLinks, that doesn't happen since you're not actually loading the page, you're just swapping it out. Uh, shout out, I don't think he's here, but David Estes, local developer who did a bunch of the support for TurboLinks when it came out and everyone was very mad. So immediately people were spamming Stack Overflow because nothing worked. Like the Rails 4 guy was like, oh yeah, just drop in TurboLinks and magically your app will be like three times faster. Uh, and instead it just it exploded with script errors. Uh, and this was especially bad because the majority of people were still pretty heavy jQuery users back in 2013. And this was also like the apex of uh, Bootstrap and all those Bootstrap plugins, like the little modals and little form things. So like almost every Rails project was using some kind of jQuery plugin. And if they turned on TurboLinks, it just didn't work. People were very mad. Uh, eventually they added this option that was called Skip Turbo Links. And basically every blog post or tutorial from this era in the internet uh, would have a, about, that was about Rails. Maybe some, not about Rails. They would start with a section about like, how to turn off Turbo Links. It was like, first thing, like install Ruby, then like next, turn off Turbo Links, then like make your first controller. Nobody really liked this thing. So everyone turned it off and they went back to work and you might think the story's over, but you know, from this darkness of TurboLinks, there comes the light. Uh, so it starts, there's this guy, Nate Berkopek. He starts coming into the picture in like 2015. Uh, Nate worked at some startups. He was kind of building an audience around like practical Rails performance tuning. So instead of having to like tune memory settings or look at something called a flame graph, uh, Nate would just do all this work and then be like, yeah, just type this thing into your Heroku console and things will be better. Uh, so that was good. And then at GoRuco 2015, Nate gave a, a really good talk. And this is where I, as far as my research goes, he coined this term, view over the wire, which is a fancy way of saying that your app would send fully rendered views over the wire instead of sending XML or JSON over the wire. 
Uh, fun fact here about Nate, he was on Shark Tank once and he did not get a deal. So in the talk, Nate was basically like, uh, hey everybody, like it's totally possible to get your Rails responses down to like 100 milliseconds. And if you do that, there's this cool thing called Turbo Links, and you can turn it on, and your app's gonna be crazy fast. And everyone had basically like turned their back on you know poor Turbo Links at, at this point. Uh, and while they were doing that, Shopify had been running it in production for several years, like battle hardening it. And so now there's a new version ready, and you can see in this slide Turbo Links 3, which was actually never released. Uh, but there's a new version coming out of Turbo Links that doesn't break up. So Nate also showed how you can use the built-in Rails caching, and it was actually not that difficult to get response times under you know, 300 milliseconds, uh, even for small teams. So you didn't need these huge infrastructure teams and dedicated caching servers and someone who knows how to tune a memcached server. Uh, and then meanwhile, then there's this other guy, Sam uh, Stephenson. He also works at Basecamp and he was working on this new TurboLynx version. He had helped extract the original version of TurboLynx. Uh, and then in 2016 at RailsConf, he gave a talk about TurboLynx 5, which is what TurboLynx 3, it's, yeah, the version went from two to five. Don't, don't worry about it. Anyways, like, holy shit, this talk is amazing. So Sam talks about TurboLynx 5, and then he does this live coding demo where he shows not only how they were using TurboLynx in Basecamp, three, the next rewrite of this thing, but also how you can reuse your existing Rails app to make like equally quick and easy iOS and Android native apps all out of the same code base. And all this was doing was using server-rendered HTML, and then you had the option with this new TurboLynx 5 to drop down to native code for the mobile apps if you needed it. So most of your stuff is like rendered web views, but if you wanted to like use the camera, then you could just hook into the frameworks and call the native stuff. Uh, the, the fact that makes this so interesting to me is that this talk was in 2015, but they had been working on this at Basecamp for 18 months at that point. So this is really like 2013, 2014 when they're doing this. This is like way before React Native was, was even a thing. So it, it's just kind of interesting. Sam also describes uh, what he called the golden age of web development. You can tell it's golden because he turned the slide yellow. And I think this is probably familiar to people that have been at a Ruby meetup or have used Rails before. So you've got your cycle. Uh, he talked about the stateless nature of HTTP and then the life cycle of the browser, which calls the router, which calls the controller. And that looks up a model and you pass it to a view and then you generate HTML and then you send it to the browser. The browser puts it in the DOM. It's simple, it's elegant, and you can work very quickly with these systems. Meanwhile, in JavaScript land, like you, can, you can start to contrast this to what's happening there. So during this time, TurboLynx 5 is coming out, or Turbo, the original TurboLynx is coming out and being ignored. You've got Backbone, then you've got Ember and Angular that come around, and then Node and NPM really start exploding. Then you've got React that comes out, and then people start moving everything to the client and they need like state management. So they uh, reach for these tools like Redux and Saga and then whatever the fuck a funk is. Uh, <laughs> and then like new tooling comes out so we can not write JavaScript, but still write JavaScript. And then there's Webpack and that's supposed to tie everything up together. But like, just take a look at that, that diagram there. Like things are not so simple anymore. There's this like explosion of complexity and Sam, I think, pretty astutely identifies that it largely mirrors the organizational structure of where these tools are from, which is Conway's law. And these tools are from Facebook and Google where they have you know, huge 100-person teams and, and people need to split work uh, so that this team can work on this part and this team can work on this part. And this is just the team that works on the server-rendered you know, JavaScript stuff for the SEO, and this is the team that works on the state management of the front-end app. Uh, so it was really refreshing hearing this talk because Sam explained that they have a pretty small team at Basecamp. I think it was maybe like six programmers total. And they were able to like, completely rewrite, yet again, Basecamp. Uh, they did it in 18 months. And Basecamp is not small, like even though we joke that it's, you know, kind of a glorified, like, you know, to-do tracker or something. 
Uh, there's over 200 screens, and so this team, this small team, was able to build out the app for five platforms. So they have a web app, they have a mobile web app, they have a native desktop app, they have an iOS app and an Android app. And I just thought, like, this is crazy leverage that like this team of six people can can do all this, uh, and I think it's worth digging into. So that kind of brings us a little bit closer to present day. So that talk was at uh, RailsConf, where Rails 5 was announced. Uh, Rails 5 came out, and that is why Turbolinks was Turbolinks 5, because it was also released with Rails 5. Uh, it was good because it wasn't broken, and I think enough time had passed that people forgot how much they hated it, and they were willing to try it again. So a lot of people were caught up with the shiny new features uh, like API mode for the people that wanted to go all in on JavaScript and Action Cable, LOL. Uh, the Turbolinks and the Rails integration I think is like the underrated gem of the Rails 5 release. So this is where it gets like a little hazy because at an unknown time, unknown place, circa 2015, uh, 2017, excuse me, uh, DHH like literally goes like full hermit and is like, I'm taking like two weeks off, don't talk to me, I'm gonna like go exploring in the Basecamp code base to like pull out some things to extract for Rails. And it sounds crazy. And then you look at the result and this is actually a two week chunk where you basically did the bulk of the work to extract Webpacker and Stimulus. So I think Webpacker is a pretty big thing for Rails going forward, and Stimulus is pretty interesting. We'll get to it in just a bit. But it was kind of crazy to me that, you know, you think about this guy, he's like, oh, I'm just gonna go spend two weeks like searching my code base, looking for patterns, and he actually like found some good stuff. So, okay, what is Stimulus? So Stimulus uh, was extracted from Basecamp like all, most all of these things that David does. Uh, he pulled it out and then Sam Stevenson, who we talked about before and this other guy, uh, Javin, they have cleaned it up. So the idea is that you sprinkle JavaScript behavior like into your existing HTML markup. This goes back to David's meme of JavaScript sprinkles. Uh, the idea was that it is gonna use the mutation observer so you don't have to deal with this document for anything. So mutation observer is a newer, JavaScript thing that uh, basically lets you say like, hey, I'm just watching this document and when new stuff comes in it, I can check if anything I'm, anything that's added is supposed to have this behavior attached to it and it you know, kind of just works. The nice part about stimulus too is that it doesn't really interfere with your cacheable HTML templates because you're just attaching stuff straight on your existing markup. You're not having little script tags anywhere or putting a bunch of rendering stuff in a JavaScript file. Uh, but really, I think the main benefit of stimulus goes back to kind of the Rails core axiom of convention over configuration. So it seems a little silly, but basically like stimulus tells you what folder to put stuff in. And I think that's actually valuable for people that get overwhelmed by the complexity of some of these JavaScript tools. So here's, here's kind of what it looks like. And the branding for stimulus. It's a modest JavaScript framework for the HTML you already have. Um, I'll just go through a quick example. So when I say you attach stuff to your, your existing HTML, in your template you would do things like adding a data controller attribute, uh, adding data target attributes, and data action. So the, the three things in stimulus are there's controllers, which are basically just a place to write your code, they go in the controllers folder and you feel like, ah, okay, I don't need to decide, they just go there. Uh, there's targets, which are ways to do like a one-way data binding that says, uh, so in this example, they're binding uh, clipboard source. So when you look at your clipboard code, you can refer to the source and it will be this DOM element, this input. And then the other thing are actions. So actions cause JavaScript code to run. So by default, if you have a button, when you click on it, it runs the data action method. So in this case, it would run the copy method on this clipboard controller. So what does this controller actually look like? You can see at the top, they're really upfront about like, this is where you put things. Uh, so source controllers, clipboard controller. You define your targets, which we mentioned before, and then you define your actions that should happen. So in this case, this little piece of JavaScript behavior that they sprinkled on it was if you have 
like a pin number. I said pin number, please. If you have a pin uh, in your app and you want a little copy button next to it, you could click this button and it would copy it to your clipboard automatically. So when you when you uh, bind it up with stimulus, it would run this copy thing, which calls this dot source target, which is a little bit of the Rails real style magic that automatically generates that variable name based on the fact that you have a target that is named source. So this dot source target, it just calls select to select everything that's in that element, and then it runs this copy exec command thing. So that kind of brings us up to date of this rabbit hole. Uh, so let's start putting these pieces together. Get out your red string. So we've got pjax, which turned into stacker at base camp, which they extracted the turbo links and rails, but that was bad. We didn't like that. Eventually it became turbo links five, and that's good. We like that. Uh, so Nate came up with this idea of view over the wire, which works well with the Russian doll caching, uh, which helps you get 100 milliseconds to glass, and that's really fast, and race cars are fast, and DHH drives race cars. <laughs> and then, so there's Basecamp, right? And Basecamp is where they extract the conventions to put in through Rails conventions over configuration, and then there's this JavaScript camber and explosion, and so then David went into the jungle and like got stimulus out, and then he open sourced it because uh, open source is basically socialism, and DHH loves socialism. <laughs> Uh, and then there's sharp knives, right? And you use sharp knives to make sushi, and sushi is Japanese, and Ruby is Japanese, and Rails is built up Ruby. Okay, but seriously, I think there's like a strong case to be made for this stack, and I think this is how you kind of draw, draw the links here. So if you have one of these like CRUD++ apps, then you're probably best off following this majestic monolith pattern, even though it has a very stupid name. And to do that, you can use TurboLinks and Stimulus, and that will let your small team do big things, and that will increase your program happiness. So I think there's some very good things happening here. So you could use Rails because it lets you crank out these really fast pages, um, but it's kind of slow and it, static HTML is not very interesting for the apps. So maybe use TurboLinks to give you snappy page loads, uh, for free, now that it works, and that's okay, but then maybe you need good performance, uh, otherwise it feels weird, like you click it and nothing happens for a couple seconds and then magically the entire page changes and there's no action. So then you'll need to add the Rails caching to make your pages load really fast, uh, and that's good and that's easy, but you still need the interactive bits, so then the last piece of the puzzle is stimulus, which then hooks into that HTML, it can still be cached, it can still render on the server, and you can just add in your, your sprinkles of behavior. So if I had to say what the, the current day omakase is, based on the tech stack that I'm using, uh, based on these tools, it's pretty much like use the stock server rendered rails, use tur turbo links up top to get around the pages, and then use stimulus at the lower level. So the things that I'm mainly using stimulus for are like the sprinkles of behavior that David is so famous for mentioning, Things like uh, modals, things like little collapsible panels, things like overflow menus, uh, things like that, where you can write just a couple lines of you know dead simple JavaScript and then hook it up to your HTML. And then the other thing we're using Stimulus for is to wrap third-party libraries that maybe don't play so nice with Stimulus, uh, don't play so nice with TurboLinks. So things like uh, custom date pickers, drop downs. So you can wrap them in, in a stimulus controller so that you get all the nice mutation observer stuff uh, and you kick off the like binding of these controls just by adding HTML attributes. But then you can still use the existing third-party plugins. Uh, yeah, and then use HTML caching to make it go fast. It's really not that hard. It's, it sort of seems scary, but if you go read Nate Berkopek's uh, blog has great articles about how to do practical caching that is super easy. Uh, even I was able to do it. And then the idea is that you would reach for these heavy, heavy duty tools on the, on the client side, things like uh, React or Vue or any of these other tools, like only as a last resort, only if you need them. So for example, Basecamp doesn't have everything in Stimulus and TurboLinks 
they have like a calendar scheduling widget, which is more complicated, and they have a separate component for that. So it's a good example. Like you can still have these other tools, just don't start with them. Uh, and if you need, you know, social proof, these things have been battle tested by Basecamp and GitHub and Shopify, which are sort of the three largest Rails apps in existence. So what's next? I don't think we've kind of reached the the physics, the what was DMC, DMG calling it, the, the grand unified theory. There's still a couple things that uh, I could see in the future. One of the nice things about Turbolinks and Stimulus is like you can use that combo outside of Rails and just have it talk to any other server template rendering language. So there's people that are using it with Phoenix, there's people that are using it with Laravel. So the more people that use it, I think the more uh, uptake this gets, and the more different ideas come together to improve it. I think there can still be even more deeper hooks into Rails if you opt into using all this stuff. So one example is actually that, like a regression from Turbolinks 2 to 5 is that in Turbolinks 2 you could do a basic, basically they called it partial replacement. So you could replace just parts of the page. So for example, maybe you had your typical app with you know, a navigation bar at the top or the side and you had a form and you wanted to just do the turbolink stuff on the form and swap out you know, your, your form with validation errors or redirect. So this is not exactly built in to Turbolinks 5 anymore. They, they sort of stripped out some of the features that were making things more complicated and they sort of leave it up to you to implement if you want that kind of behavior. Um, Kind of in the background while this is happening, this is kind of like the Avengers, like after the credits style thing. There's this guy, Chris McCord, uh, and he's, he's been toying with these ideas like on a parallel track. So at ElixirConf of this year, Chris McCord announced this thing called LiveView, which it's basically the same concept, uh, except you add like WebSockets or WebSocket-ish type things to do real-time updates of your partials. So not based on an Ajax call, but you use some of the ideas from Elixir and Erlang to have things that get updated real-time. So the demo for that is actually really interesting. They end up like rendering this animation, with, which is rendered server-side, and they stream down the updated partials to it. And it's fast enough that they can get like 60 FPS animation in the browser even though every frame is a separate call to the server. So that's very cool. And then I'm curious to see if this ends up being at all viable as like a React Native killer. I think the speed of building uh, server rendered views is way faster even than some of the React Native stuff. So I think a lot of the React Native tool chain is interesting I just don't know if it makes sense for most apps. If you think about most mobile apps, I think a pretty common pattern is you have a list of items that you're rendering and you can drill down to those to see the details and then take some actions on it. And I don't know if necessarily re-implementing that all on the client side versus rendering an HTML list tag that has appropriate mobile styling applied to it is all that better. So, thank you for at least humoring me in my quest. I hope I gave you an idea of what this tool chain is and maybe inspired you to take a second or first look at it. And I hope that you do not think that I am a crazy, insane person who draws strange conclusions with red string. Thank you. <laughs> yes, any questions, Dave? Thank you for your thought leadership. Oh, no problem. That's a real tweet that DHH sent me about being a thought leader. It was a joke, but I didn't take it like that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Have, have I used any of the what stuff? Oh, the native stuff. No, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah, it looks very cool. I have some background in doing native development for Android, so it's been interesting to see how many weeks and months I spent writing stuff that could have been like an afternoon in Turbolinks, allegedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the documentation for both of these projects, TurboLinks and Stimulus, is excellent. Like best in breed, technical documentation. So I would start start there. It's pretty easy to get it going. Like in Rails, it is the default still, unless you have opted out. Uh, but it's pretty easy to get going on that. Stimulus has a, uh, they have the documentation and they, it's in the form of like a handbook. So they, they talk a little bit about the motivation, which would cover some of the material I talked about today. And then they go through, here's a toy example. And then here's an example of building something real. And then here's an example of something that we use this for in Basecamp that gets a lot of uh, benefit and then you're off on your way. The nice part about TurboLinks is that it's got a pretty small API surface. You don't really do anything. You just kind of turn it on and then you click the links and make sure it sort of works. So the only real work is kind of turning it on and then maybe adjusting your expectations for what should be happening when you uh, trigger certain actions in your app. And the same, for, same thing for stimulus. It's pretty easy to just start writing your first controllers and then uh, hooking them into the, you can either do it through the asset pipeline or you can do it through Webpacker. And it's the same thing, they kind of just turn on. So you put the file in the folder and then it starts working. Cool. Well, if anyone else wants to talk, I'll be hanging around after, and you can see me Saturday at the Indie Hackers party. Woo! Thank you very much, Matt.